Academies of Medicine, and I'm co-chairing this workshop together with uh, my colleague Tachi, who is also with us today. So thank you all for joining, and it's a, I'm really delighted to welcome you to the second day of um, the workshop, as our first day, which uh, took place on Tuesday, was even uh, was really very, very inspiring. In fact, in the first session, we looked at what are the biomedical advances for healthy longevity, and, and that session, and with really rich discussions, was introduced by an inspiring keynote from uh, Eric Verdun. And Eric was really demonstrating us how the demo demographic shift is increasing the sizes of uh, aging populations as compared to those of younger people, but also um, talking about what the exact mechanisms of aging are and the pathways we have identified to act upon those. Then he stressed how important it is to step away in the healthcare sector from considering people as a collection of organs that need to be treated whenever they are sick by different specialists. And he really uh, was advocating for us to take a holistic look at a person from an entire um, system person, so that, and therefore our, syst our health systems should really also transform themselves from being these reactive care systems that are waiting for people to get sick um, to becoming more proactive predictive and ultimately preventative so that they can become true health systems that keep their populations healthy. And in our second session, we looked at what the technological advances for healthy longevity were, and that was uh, introduced by a really brilliant, inspiring keynote from Joe Cochling from MIT HLAB, who gave us an overview of how age technology or technology for aging was influenced by, in fact, the wrong story we tell about aging. We, we consider it as a health issue, or we consider the aging adults as a vulnerable group, group with increased disabilities and dysfunctionalities, but not really as um, an opportunity to contribute to and enrich our societies. So he highlighted how that wrong story has in, fa in fact uh, influence the way age tech has been evolving in different waves, with the first wave really looking at age tech as um, being assistive technology to help people with disabilities, the second wave where tech was um, really used to monitor and manage the physical health and safety of people, like in smart homes um, that we know, and the third wave is where we are currently in where HTEC is uh, seen as a consumer market, an economy, an opportunity. And he even states, stated, uh, which will always remain with me, is that tech has become the new toilet paper, a necessity, because that's what we were really hamstring and buying en masse at the start of our lockdowns uh, in the pandemic. But these waves now really call for a next phase where the governments become the agenda setters and become the agenda setters to ensure equity and inclusion of technology for healthy aging. So that is exactly what our workshop uh, sessions today, the first session, at least what this will be today, is exactly about that. How are we gonna ensure that these transformative innovations and technologies get implemented and rolled out as largely as possible and get into the hands of the people who need them? Because what better opportunity do we have, in fact, than the fact that we live in a digital era? We have this opportunity to transform our societies into age-friendly societies that fully address the needs of these growing populations and that allows the older generations to actively participate and enrich our societies. It also gives us the opportunity to make our health systems true health systems and go through that transformation from being reactive care systems to proactive, predictive, and preventative systems. The world we live in today, the post-COVID world or the COVID world is still, still here. It's not the same as the one we had before and the old world is not coming back. But we really have the momentum now where the argument for tackling inequities and addressing the underlying social and digital determinants of health has never been stronger. 
In fact, we know that the future is already here, it's just not equally distributed. And the last thing we want to achieve is that we have a risk to increase the digital divide and inequities. So let's now see together how we can best contribute to that. And we start this exciting third session of the National Academies of Medicine workshop on science and technology for healthy longevity with an introductory keynote by Michelle Grimm, um, which will be followed by a discussion with um, an incredible group of experts in the field of implementing innovations and technology. So before I introduce our um, keynote speaker, let me invite all the participants who are on the live stream to submit your questions and suggestions or comments to the following email address. In fact, um, it's called healthy longevity in one word at nas.edu. And for all the discussants here together with me who will um, help us through uh, discovering how we can best do that, ensuring that the rollout of innovations through the largest part of the populations, I would lo love to ask you to just raise your hand and I'll see them um, who we can give the floor at the right moment. So let me start by introducing Michelle. Michelle Grimm is the Wielanger Creative Engineering Professor of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering at Michigan State University. And she earned her bachelor's in biomedical engineering and engineering mechanics from Johns Hopkins before she moved to the University of Pennsylvania, where Michelle earned her master's and her PhD in bioengineering. Then Michelle joined the Wayne State University in Detroit in 94, where she built a scientific research portfolio focusing on injury biomechanics from characterizing important tissue properties to developing appropriate models for the assessment of injury mechanisms. But Michelle has been interested for many years in the application of engineering design process to solve pro pro problems in biomedical engineering. And this became very important as she developed an educational program at Wayne State that was centered around the application of design within biomedical engineering. In 2016, Michelle took a leave of absence and, and um, joined um, as a program director at the National Science Foundation. She oversaw their three programs related to biomedical engineering, but while Michelle was there, she was asked to co-chair the White House Task Force on R&D for Technology to Support Aging Adults. And when she completed her federal service, she joined Michigan State University in her current position. And that's where Michelle comes from as a um, member, colleague of the Commission for, on the Global Roadmap for Healthy Longevity. So Michelle, please, um, the floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On Tuesday, we had an extensive discussion regarding not only some of the advances, but also some of the hurdles that we face when it comes to applying scientific and technological innovations to support our goal of healthy longevity. Even before the second session that day, I had planned on talking about some of the challenges that we see from an engineering perspective when it comes to actually translating these innovations beyond a single bedside to broader adoption. As members of the commission, we were challenged to envision healthy longevity, not for five years from now, not even for 10 years from now, but to really push ourselves to imagine what that might be 50 years in the future. It is by starting with that possibility of tremendous innovation on all levels that we can hope to identify ideas where advances and efforts should be made in order to truly develop the innovations that we need to meet this goal. When it comes to healthy longevity, technology and science play pivotal roles, and these roles span from the individual level to broader society, with many gradations in between. This includes infrastructure needs, such as buildings, transportation systems, and the systems needed for adequate broadband and wireless spectrum, interpersonal communication with family and friends, as well as communication with medical providers, is a key area that we have seen be impacted by technology, especially in this past year. While on Tuesday, we discussed the holy grail of treatments that might significantly delay the onset of what may be considered age-related diseases and disorders. In the meantime, 
developing systems for earlier diagnosis and treatment of the diseases and injuries that do occur will reduce their impact on our health span. And while we have not yet found that holy grail, identifying, developing, and tracking activities that can allow us to delay the onset of these age-related conditions will also be of tremendous impact. As we look at the possibilities that lie before us, it's important to realize that the scientific and technological advances in and of themselves will not help us meet our goal of matching health span to lifespan. That goal can only be met if the appropriate science and technology are actually adopted and disseminated in an equitable fashion at all of these levels. In order to have an impact, there are three broad steps that must be achieved for any new or improved technology and science. Development refers to traditional R&D, both basic and translational research, as well as design and verification of new engineered systems or technologies. Once it has been determined that this advance is possible, implementation moves that idea or concept from the lab or prototype to the real world, including clinical trials where it is appropriate. Oftentimes during implementation, having people buy in early to the innovation will require incentives, but those may not be practical once the system is taken out to a broader market. That scale up before adoption requires significant market research, as well as discussions regarding manufacturing and in the sphere of healthcare reimbursement. In order to truly have that final impact, the system needs to be adopted, which requires true buy-in from the targeted users, their families, caregivers, and medical providers. If that buy-in does not exist, it is unlikely that a system will successfully go from the early adopter or clinical research phase to broad implementation. And if we really want to make sure that a system has a lasting impact on individuals and society with respect to healthy longevity, we also need to consider a fourth step in this process, which is retention. Through well-designed support and regular updates to the technology, it will hopefully be a system or device that can support healthy longevity for a significant period of time. I'm sure that most of you have heard about the valleys of death that exist when it comes to translation and commercialization of scientific and technological advances. Successful translation is the goal for all entities that support research and development, even those that have a mission of funding the most basic research. We can easily understand this goal from the point of view of industry or venture capital who are seeking a return on their investment. For government funded basic research or translational research, it's not really a return on investment that agencies or elected officials are looking for, but they do want to see that the research that they are funding is having an impact on society, even if it is 10 or 20 years down the road. It is very possible to get to the end of the prototype or pilot manufacturing stage based on simply a cool idea by either working on a shoestring budget or successfully finding those investors that are willing to take a big risk. Those systems can be developed and the concept can be demonstrated. However, to get through the commercialization valley and into the actual market entry and adoption phases, we need to have designed something that is actually wanted by the intended users, not simply something that we believe they may want. Very briefly, I'm gonna go over a couple of case studies that illustrate why taking user needs into account and really developing systems with the user in mind is an important facet of transitioning an engineered system or scientific discovery from small scale application to much broader use. One of the things that shows our age is whether or not we remember the Betamax versus VHS battles from the 1970s and 80s. Sony was the first to market with its Betamax video recorder in 1975, and they tightly held control of the license for the technology in order to, they thought, maximize their market share and profit. In 1975, JVC decided that rather than paying a competitor to license the Betamax technology, they would develop their own system, which they dubbed VHS. Before we get to the reasons why, it's important to realize what the shift in market share was for those two formats between 1975 and 1987, with Betamax going from full control of the market for home VCRs to having less than 5% of the market only 12 years later. So why did this shift occur? The Betamax format provided high quality recordings in a smaller footprint, which should lead one to think that it had the upper hand when it came to selection by the public. 
However, JVC opted to come up with a shared set of standards rather than focusing on licensing its technology, which allowed many companies to enter the VCR market as well as the videotape market and resulted in lower prices. But beyond the price factor, one of the common concerns raised by Betamax users was the fact that each tape was only one hour long. This meant that they could not even record a full football game on a single tape. It was only useful for recording one episode of a dramatic TV show or two episodes of sitcoms. In comparison, while VHS tapes had a standard normal length of 120 minutes of recording, they could be used to record and play back in both long playing and super long playing settings. It was this ability to record for longer periods of time, which Sony did not pay attention to when they spoke with potential users, that was one of the primary reasons that VHS became the dominant format within the VCR market. But sometimes the success or failure of a product is not based on competition, but based on decisions about that product alone. Moving to an example from the healthcare sphere, one example that did not, did not succeed from a company that has had significant success in general was Microsoft's Health Vault. This system was a cloud-based means to store personal medical records, but it only lasted 12 years before the software and support for it were terminated by Microsoft. The failure of adoption for this software seems to stem from the fact that it did not allow for easy entry of personal health data, such as might be obtained through wearables. It also did not provide users with any ability to see how their data within their actual medical record changed with time. As a result, the system really only served as a way to store and access medical records from multiple providers. And it did not give any insight or suggestions for things that an individual could change to improve their health through preventive care and activities. Through the failure of this system, two significant user needs were identified two-way communication of data between the patient and the provider, as well as the ability to leverage data that is either entered personally or comes from the medical record in such a way that it can provide feedback to the user. Both of these aspects would allow an individual to be more engaged with their medical records and various biomarkers, hopefully in such a way that they would use this information to make changes in their behavior. One example of what appears to be a successful product in the medical realm is the Ergo hearing aid. The company that designed and manufactures this system was founded in 2013 and had an IPO five years later. Their market share continues to increase even during the craziness that we've experienced this past year due to the pandemic. The success of this internal hearing aid appears to be due in large part to the fact that the designers listen closely to the population when developing their system. Rather than constantly replacing batteries, the system is rechargeable. The new model is waterproof, and it has a small profile and is not easily visible within the ear. But even more important than these factors is the fact that the Ergo system does not require a prescription from a physician or an audiologist. And any interactions with audiologists for tuning or questions are conducted virtually. This makes it easier for an individual to seek out the system and the 45-day trial period provides the user with a chance to determine whether or not the system really does meet their needs. We'll see whether or not this particular device maintains its success, but it's clear that the design considered some of the most common user complaints that exist about other hearing aid technologies. So what are the challenges that need to be thought about and addressed when a new technology or scientific advancement is being introduced to the market? Skepticism that can negatively impact adoption of any new technology can come from both clinical providers and the users themselves. Beyond the question of whether the system works or is better than what the intended user currently has access to, the provider is likely to provide negative feedback to their patient about using a new system if it will make their job more difficult, take more time for future visits, or unfortunately, if it will affect their economic prospects in the long run. For the intended user, ease of use and a familiar interface are key factors in adoption of new technologies. And as we discussed on Tuesday, having an infrastructure and policies in place that support new technologies are key societal concerns that can move a new device from being an expensive paperweight to something that is broadly and equitably used. So when it is time to consider translating a system from the bench towards broad adoption, it is essential that all of the intended users be identified. 
It's imperative that the system developers understand differences that will likely exist due to not only demographics and cultural considerations, but also the physical capabilities and limitations and the wide range of those abilities among the intended user group. Comfort using technology must also be considered with some individuals having experience using high-tech systems to a greater extent than others. And we must keep in mind that this is an ever shifting state as generations that grew up with different levels of technology may start to become part of the intended user group. And finally, the economic status, not only of the individual potential user, but also of the country must be considered when a plan is put in place for broad adoption of a new technology or scientific advance. One way to approach the fact that potential users are different is through the concept of universal design, which tries to develop a single design that will work for everybody by being accessible and barrier free. However, designing a system through this framework may result in a device that is not optimized for anybody, even if it can be used by everybody. Google Glass is a great example of a design failure that was developed through the universal design framework. When it was introduced, it was considered to be a very cool idea that could support teenagers in gaming, working professionals in communicating with their handheld devices, and individuals with disabilities or the aging population in interacting with the outside world. One of my student design groups even went as far as to try and develop an interface with the Google Glass that assisted individuals who were suffering from aphasia by prompting them to find the appropriate word when they were struggling in a face-to-face -face conversation. Unfortunately, while we can envision a multitude of applications with this technology, it was not widely adopted and has basically disappeared from the marketplace. It really did not meet the needs of any of the potential groups. So a second framework for design is called user-centered design. And this was mentioned by Gilda Garabino on Tuesday when she described Olin College's Engineering for Humanity course. User-centered design integrates the intended user or group of users into the entire design process, not only at the outset when the needs for the system are identified, but also during various design reviews or evaluation of the prototype before the system's design is finalized. Such processes can extend from the design of a device or widget to the design of the underlying system that is needed to make that device or widget truly functional including in the areas of infrastructure and policy. The ultimate result of user-centered design is that devices and their interfaces will be personalized to the varying needs of each user and that the system will be able to adapt or be modified as that user's needs and abilities change with time. User-centered design, at least if deployed successfully, builds on the realization that we as engineers may not have the same life experiences as our intended user group. And so our own attempts to identify the needs for a device will fall short if we do not make a substantial effort to understand what the intended users actually want, what they truly need, and importantly, that they are not a single monolithic group in most cases. So beyond the efforts that can take place to communicate with the users throughout the design and implementation process, it would be beneficial if we strived not only for user-centered design, but also for empathetic design, where the designers really try to understand why the intended users have expressed the needs for the system that they have articulated. User-centered design can also be significantly improved if there truly are collaborations between scientists engineers and social scientists working together to try and develop new strategies to solve an identified problem. This may be the missing link to reaching the goal of transformative outcomes that panel members on Tuesday indicated that we were not yet meeting, even when user-centered design is attempted. However, if there is a group of individuals working together from not only different engineering disciplines, but different realms of knowledge and experience, and those individuals work together throughout the project, we can hope that the sum will be greater than the parts, and we will actually get to a point where we have convergence in the results of our design process. This will allow us to integrate societal factors into the solution right from the beginning, as these may impact the implementation and adoption of the system or device. While it is possible to develop a functional design without considering these factors, 
no system will be widely adopted or accepted in isolation of those key societal considerations. This is the user-centered design cycle that I had shown previously. And while there are iterations that take place, it has one general direction, moving from project start to project launch. There are many ways to portray this cycle, to show the path from assessment of user needs to full implementation. And it can even be expanded to include the fundamental research that is conducted and then allows the translational applications to be developed. But I propose that we need a more connected cycle of research and design where there is back and forth at each transition point and users are fully integrated into the complete cycle. Understanding user needs should to some extent inform the areas in which fundamental research is pursued and supported, rather than waiting until the application of those scientific results is being considered through technology development. All of this process of scientific inquiry and technology development should be enveloped within the domain expertise of social scientists so that we never forget the importance of those societal factors that will affect the success of any system we are developing, both in terms of function and adoption. So how do we get to this level of improved user-centered design or empathetic design? We cannot expect to have scientists and engineers step into this convergent framework for design without practicing it first. Educational programs, both degree-focused and continuing education, need to provide opportunities for individuals to really learn how to work together, how to integrate the various domains of knowledge, and how to take advantage of that convergence of fields of knowledge to produce scientific and technological products and systems that will be adopted widely enough to have an impact on healthy longevity at a societal level. We have been working on developing this convergent user-centered design with engineering to a limited extent with some universities and industries developing this more than others. I was asked for this presentation to consider how, how what we know about this framework for technology design and implementation from the world of engineering could be applied to the domains of biomedical science and health. If you consider the design process to essentially be a problem solving process, it is obvious that it can be applied to all fields of science and medicine. And it truly does represent a systematic way to address any challenge or problem that may be presented. Scientific research, especially in the biomedical field, should always keep in mind the societal views and the state of technology. Will there need to be advances in technology to deploy the system that is being researched? Is there a need for additional foundational research in physical sciences to advance technology so that it is ready? Is society currently ready for the scientific advance? And if not, what discussions should there be to prepare society for this important advancement? Or how can our understanding of societal values be integrated into the science to minimize these challenges? Irrespective of how we picture our future back vision of healthy longevity 50 years from now, science and technology will be key to helping us meet that goal as individuals and as a society. And with that, I'm happy to open things up for questions and a broader discussion with the esteemed group of individuals that are here today. <laughs>